welcome to worship. And uh, Pastor told me a few things about the message. One was topic he's talking about is doing good. And uh, like being a good Samaritan type of thing. So I'm going to show you a guy that, that uh, he's doing a good Samaritan thing here.
just got uh, clearance yesterday to, uh, we've been wanting to go back uh, about a year ago, <coughs> I think. We, we went out and uh, brought Sandy Mountain, was able to come outside, and we was able to have a service with her outside. Uh, so nobody has to go in and go through all the rigmarole. And so uh, we're going to try that. We'll try to be down there at 6 uh, tonight and uh, bring a lawn chair. We're going to try to sing some songs and read some scripture with her. Uh, we also want to try to touch base with, with Juanita if that's going to we'll try to work that out with the schedule wise um, because they have some people that come in she says from the, from the Hillview Baptist Church I think it is Hilltop, Hilltop, Hilltop you're right and uh, so and again it's wonderful but it's not your people it's not the ones that know you it's not the ones you worshiped with for many years so uh, we're going to try to find a way to to hit both places or Ideally, if we could have them both in one place, it'd be wonderful, but we'll see what, what we can work out. But 6 o'clock tonight, not meeting here, we're going to meet down there at uh, Indian Haven and have an outside service. Just pray that there's not any rain. If so, uh, pray with faith. If not, bring an umbrella. Uh, <laughs> All right, those are the climb team, not 6.30, 6 o'clock.
Thanks. Thank you. Our first congregation always comes from times are here. Talking about the second coming.
the church for the prayers that they sent. Um, I remain a disciple of Jesus Christ, Mike Briggs. And uh, some of you, some of you seen last Sunday, I got a text from Cindy that he's back in Maine on the trail and he's planning on going about a month. Uh, so he's testing his new uh, pacemaker out to make sure it works okay. <laughs> um, he does have a nurse with him, a, a, a fellow that they call Hobo, uh, who's who took part, who's done part of the trail with him in the past as well. So um, he was determined he's going to try. You don't think he can finish or not yet because of a, a doctor's appointment he's got to meet uh, in about a month. But pray for Mike as he's on the trail. He really wants to finish this. It's a lifelong uh, dream of his, and his father's as well passed down to him. So. Any, any other prayer requests, prayer support you want to share? Yeah, Pastor Paul, my brother, my younger brother, Rod, he just called me yesterday. Um, he went in for just a colonoscopy. Well, it didn't turn out well. Okay. Um, he has a lot of polyps, and he has a mass that has to be removed. Okay. Uh, fortunately, it didn't perforate the bowel. So we just keep him in prayer and hope everything comes out right. Okay. Remember his brother, Rod, who's got to have surgery for Mass. Any others? Yes. Yeah, uh, I called, well, Rich called about uh, my son, uh, Eric. Uh, he went to the hospital. He has a six plus millimeter stone, millimeter stone in him. Ooh. So he had 36 hours of not eating and uh, found out that the doctor was still over at Punxsy doing uh, whatever. And uh, so when he got there, he took him down to the emergency room only to find out when everything was ready, the machine busted. So, uh -huh. so now, and I told him, I said, I can't believe that this beautiful pavement and this hospital and that, and you don't have an extra machine. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I was a little bit, you know how moms yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, moms yeah. take care of, care of their kids. But, uh, but anyhow, two weeks, I guess he has to wait for two weeks to see if the stone passes. It won't pass. <laughs> yeah, so keep them in your prayers. Yes. If I have right. to buy the machine, I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Anyone else? Yes, Dan. Sam, Samuel said, stopped me this morning, and he's got a, a friend of his at IUP that um, was pretty sick. Um, was at the Indiana hospital. They diagnosed her and wanted to keep her, but she ended up signing out AMA. Um, lots going on. Sam just asked if we would remember this young lady. Okay, that was this friend of Sam's. Um, somebody else tried to say something. I, um, I wanted to say something. That's for the whole church on that. Uh, Pam, she listens to you mm -hmm. on the thing now from yeah. New York. 
she told me the other night, she said, you know what, you tell that pastor that he has been really an impression on my son. He goes to church now, <laughs> and he don't miss Sunday for nothing, even if it's... <laughs> so uh, keep him in your prayers and that. You never know when you're going to touch somebody's well, heart. Well, you know, I went to Ohio yesterday to do uh, the help with a wedding uh, for a friend of ours who doesn't have a license yet. She's on her way, but so I had to be the one to sign for the <coughs> wedding. And I saw it while I was there. Somebody had sent a message. I want to. I want you to baptize me here in town. I said okay. So I was supposed to meet him, do him, maybe his wife, or maybe one of their children. And so I got there yesterday and uh, started to baptize. There ended up being eight. Were baptized there, and then they said, uh, There's another pond, some people are waiting over there, so I went over there, <laughs> and there was five more, so I ended up being 13. Was baptized yesterday. I didn't plan on nearly that many, but it was fantastic. Praise uh, the Lord. All yeah. the ones I deer hunted with out in Ohio, this is finally getting the results of all that all that deer hunting, I guess. So uh, Amen. that's been good. Uh, remember Butch as well, uh, and Darlene, uh, let's not forget them. The one that was pregnant. The one that was pregnant that you baptized. Oh, oh yeah. The, I mean, they haven't been to church a lot. And so I got done baptizing the husband and then the wife. And she said, well, you got you got two for that one. She said, I just found out I'm pregnant. <laughs> so they got, and then they brought the little one out who's one year old. And says, I said, uh, you want me to baptize him? So I can't dunk this kid. He's a year old. So I'm, I'm going to. So I'll go spray <coughs> him and dedicate him right there in the pond. So that was uh, quite different. Never done it before. So any uh, for, any prayer requests, praise reports, anything good happen? My grandkids on Thursday at Heidi House. Um, my church is going fine. I go to the back. I call that every week. I pray that I wouldn't have my mind even with it. And the church is church is there. They're busy Friday week. <laughs> that's good. Family reunion, there wasn't any family fights. So that's, that's always good. Family. Anything else? Remember this friend, Daniel, still. Last I heard, they were trying to get him home, but I haven't heard okay. from Gretchen. This is our friend that was in the hospital who's been battling hepatitis C, I think, for about 25 years. And they didn't think he was going to get out of the hospital. And, and they said, Can you contact him? And he can't talk. Uh, he's, he's got that weak, didn't think he was going to make it. And I said, well, Just put the phone on speaker and let me talk to him. Talk to him about Jesus. So I shared John 3.16, which he's heard, he was raised in church, but he struggled to believe. And uh, so he did make some muffled sounds that, that he heard me. And so just pray that the seed will continue to do work in him. He's not got much time unless God does another miracle, but um, it keeps him going. It's just amazing he's even still here. Amen. The grace of God. Anything else? Unspoken request you have, you want to before the Lord this morning. Okay. Standing, if you would, as we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning. <coughs> our altars are open for special needs and concerns of the heart, so feel free to join us at the altar.
children and sin. We bring them before you this morning. Lay them before your altar. You know those who need a touch in their life, a touch on their health, those who need jobs to be opened up. Lord, we pray that you would open those up like only you can do, that you would be glorified for it. And even our dreams that we have wanted so badly when they are buried, show us that you're the God of resurrection, that nothing is too hard for you. Lord, as you waited on Mary and Martha when, her, when Lazarus was sick and you waited till it was absolutely, totally too late. And then you just stepped in and did it anyway. Father, remind us, Lord, that you're the God who's still on time, even when you're four days late. We pray that you would hear these requests, Lord, and we thank you for the one with the train accident, that the way you brought her through, Lord, that didn't seem like it was possible, but you still did to continue to help her and, and be with her. And for Amy, continue to touch her as she struggles with cancer, Lord, bring healing and bring her heart to you. And for Daniel, as you would save him, Father, may he be able to believe. Give him the, give him the gift of faith, Lord, that only you can do. Father, for this brother Rod who needs your touch and healing, Lord, as he goes through surgery, be with him and for Eric, Lord, that you would watch over his life and, and touch him as well with your healing touch, Lord. May they see your presence in their life and for those who are watching online, Father, and the burdens that they carry and, and the ones, no matter where they are, Father, let them know that you know where they're at, that you see them and that you, are, you will bless them and help them, Father. Let them hear your word. Father, for each unspoken request, Lord, we pray that you would hear those this morning as well. Father, we ask that you would push the rain back, Father, and, and let us be able to have an outside service, Lord, with those who have been shut off from their church family, Lord, through no fault of their own. And they want to be with their church family, Lord, make it happen today, Lord, only you can do it. Father, give us your grace, we pray, in this day, only you can can give it, Father. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. We don't come here because we deserve wages for all the good things we've done. But because of your grace, you give us what we need and what we desire, even though we don't deserve it. And Father, remind us how good you are, how great your grace is. Lord, hear these requests, spoken and unspoken. We thank you. You never forget one. In our minds, we can't always remember, but you can. Lord, help those we pray today that have been called out in prayer. We lift them before you. We glorify you. We praise you in advance for what you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, for hearing them and answering prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sunday in the park, you know that we had to have Rhett because the wind starts blowing every time we kind of sings down there. The music starts blowing, and so this time Rhett had to go up and hold it down so it wouldn't blow away. And uh, so it was quite an adventure down there. Jack came to bite me in the butt because before we came, he was like, I'm going to be your manager, I'm going to be your helper. And I'm like, no. And my music starts blowing, I'm like, uh, Rhett? <laughs> That's cute.
Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Several times in the book of Revelation it says, He who overcomes, he who overcomes, it gives you a very simple understanding, and that is, you're not going to coast into heaven. Can't just get saved and just lollygag your way in. Uh, Jude says you have to contend for the faith. You're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to battle for it. Uh, you're going to have to overcome everything that Satan throws in your path. Uh, it's not just an easy way. And uh, just just get there. So let's look at the the uh, last of the book of Jude, the last third, and I covered this other one again because I'm going to come to it. It says, Any the seventh from Adam, in other words, the seventh generation, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones, or angels, to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness. And of all the defiant words, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now we're going to skip a verse. Down at verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. This is our, our memory verse for last week. Hope you memorize it. To him, or God, who is able to keep you from stumbling or falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Gracious Father, help us to understand what Jude is trying to speak to us about. Help us to grasp it in our spirits, Lord. Cause our hearts to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus prepare us for the word of God and help us Lord may our tongue be touched by your spirit enable us to communicate your holy word with the unction of the Holy Spirit upon it we ask in Jesus name Amen we come down to the idea of good works and, and he talks about the evil works that they've done but also in verse 20 in 21, he talks about building themselves up or something to do in your holy faith. Keep yourselves. Uh, be merciful to these ones. Snatch those ones. He's talking about good works. But there's two things we need to see about good works. The first is the false teaching that is out there that I can somehow work my way into heaven. If I do enough good things, even Muhammad Ali's idea of it was, if my good things I've done outweighs my bad on the scale, then I go to heaven. But the Bible says that there's no way we can get to heaven by our good works. Uh, we can't do enough, we can't give enough. Warren Buffett uh, said a few years ago he was given uh, most of his $42 billion um, estate away to charities. 
and uh, then kind of patting himself on the back of how generous he was, he said, this is not the only way to get to heaven, but it's a good way. I'm sorry, but you can't buy your way in with $30 million, or a billion dollars, I guess I should say. In fact, if, if it costs $30 billion to go to heaven, how many of you are going? We can't buy our way in. There's no good works. But as I said last week, every religion on the planet, except for Christianity, is about working your way into heaven. If I do enough works, Jehovah Witness say that if you knock on enough doors, do enough things, you might be in the 144,000 going to heaven. But you're not sure. Other ones, you work and work and work, and you hope that God will make a way to, for you to get to heaven. But the Bible says that it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. And so good works cannot get you into heaven. And we hear it even in the church. I've heard it in my churches where they, you'll hear something say like this. They'll say, well, if anybody's going to heaven, it would be Clyde Rowe. He was a guy in our church. Godly man. That's basically saying he lives so good that I'm sure he's going to heaven. But if I can't live like that, then I can't go to heaven. But nobody, nobody goes to heaven by doing good works. Uh, no matter what you do, it's not enough. There's never enough good works. He says that the faith that we want comes, come, uh, the, the heaven we want, the salvation we want comes by faith. Comes by faith in what God's already done. Now that's the one side is good works cannot get us to heaven no matter how many we do. On the other side, if God, if we put our faith in Jesus and we receive salvation by faith, not by works, because our hearts have been changed, we will begin, as he says, doing the works that God has prepared before we were born. So we will do things because our hearts have been changed, but it will never get us to heaven. The works come after our hearts have been changed, not in order to be accepted. We're not accepted by God for what we've done, but because we've been accepted by faith, then we want to show our appreciation to him for what we do. And if we don't do anything for God, if there's no good works, then we probably haven't been changed. But it's not enough just to do it to get in. Verse 9 talks about the devil. And strangely, two-thirds of Americans do not believe the devil really exists as a living entity. It's just your imagination. But the Bible says there is a devil, and it says he was arguing with Michael over the body of Moses. And so there is a real devil. And just because you put your faith in Jesus and start following Jesus, Satan doesn't say, oh man, I'm so sorry I lost them. I guess I'll get the next one. He will follow you all the way to heaven's door trying to get you to turn back. Amen. He'll try to trip you up. Uh, he'll try to do everything he can throw about the world, the temptation, trying to use sinful nature, the world, the flesh, and the devil to get you to turn around. In fact, he says, Paul says in Corinthians, if you think you're standing firm, be alert that you don't fall. The false teaching is that once you've got saved, then it doesn't matter you're going to heaven and we can, we can just, don't worry about it. So you can lollygag your way in if, if that teaching is true. That once you're saved, then no matter what you do, you're still going to heaven. Uh, so we have to be careful uh, of that because Satan wants you to turn around and, and, and Jude tells it here very plainly he says I'm not messing with you he says think back think back about the people who left Egypt and started to the promised land but because they didn't believe when they came to the place that God was going to take them in they all died in the wilderness for 40 years they died they never made it in they come out of Egypt but they never got to the promised land and they says, think about the angels that God created. And at some point, part of them says, we don't want to serve God anymore. We want to do something else. And said, now they're being kept in chains of darkness until the day of judgment, which the Christians will then judge them. And so he's reminding us that you can fall away because he says in the very first two verses that we've been kept by Jesus Christ. And he says in that next to last verse, 
unto him who's able to keep you from falling. So he's saying you can fall, but you don't have to. God can keep you if you'll let him. But be careful that you don't get drawn away. One of my dearest friends, Assemblies of God pastor, anointed by God, powerfully used for several years in revivals and I don't know what happened. Something happened and he walked away, walked away from God, walked away from the church. His wife passed away this last week or two and he just went off the rails. Just mad at everything. Upset. One who once knew God so close and yet now has no time or room for God or no faith. And so he's faced this loss by himself. Think how in the world can you be so used of God in the past and now you do everything but that now? Because there is a devil and he will chase you and try to bring you back, try to bring you down. Do everything he can to keep you out of church. Everything he can to keep you from reading the Bible. Everything he can to keep you from praying. Distractions. But God is trying to get us into sanctification and holy living. He wants you to be holy. He said, be holy because I'm holy. And when God saves us, he changes our heart. And we begin to grow. We begin to add good things to our life. As we talked in Sunday school, we begin to give up some bad things. And there'll come a time in our life of full surrender when God says, I know you've given me your sins and, and you've given me, let me come into your life, but I want full control now. Will you, will you really let me have all of you? You have to make that decision. As Abraham did with Isaac on the mountain, God says, do you love me more than you love Isaac, your most treasured possession? And Abraham said yes. And we are going to come to the point we have to surrender our everything. To put the old sin nature to death. And so we can begin to live holy. We don't have to live in Romans 7 all of our life. We, there are some who say we have to we sin in word, thought, and deed every day. Well, you can, but you don't have to. We don't have to live in that on that treadmill of sin. God has the power to keep us, he says. And the holiness church has taught that God has the power to do that. And you say, well, you're like the guy who said to the preacher, well, I don't believe I can keep from sinning. He said, you think God's got enough power to keep you from sinning for one second? Well, yeah, probably for one second. How about a minute? Is God powerful enough to keep you from sinning for one minute? Probably, probably one minute. How about an hour? Well, I, I guess God can keep me for an hour. So if God can keep you for an hour, why not a day? What, why not longer? What, why is God unable to change us so that we can live differently, that we can live holy as he, as he lives, as he wants us to live. He comes with his spirit inside of us to change our desires. He stares, he talks there about the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit and the guidance of the spirit. And he tells us in verse 20 of Jude, he says, pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the spirit. Now, Different churches have tried to define that. Uh, Jack Hayford, who is a Pentecostal, who says, he said, that does not mean just praying in tongues. He said it could be, but said it's any prayer that's guided by the Spirit. Any prayer which the Spirit tells us what to pray for. He says, pray in the Spirit, not just what I want to pray. When I tell God, give my, give my demand list to God, but... Do we listen to what the Spirit is teaching us to pray and telling us to pray and moving us to pray? There are some who believe that the gifts of the Spirit have all been in the past. They've all ceased. But the Western Church doesn't believe that. They believe that every gift that God has given is still in operation today uh, and still doing that. In the Church of Jesus Christ, the Church itself is, I like the old Joe, Joe Hemphill song that says, I'm in this church. This glorious church. I didn't join. I was born. I had a new birth. Some glorious day I'm going to sail away. It's by his grace. Not by my works. I'm in this church. He talks about the church here. Jude talks about their love feast. Which is their communion that they take. When they come and eat a meal together. And they take holy communion. 
We want to do that uh, probably next week. We want to do it this week. Do I think we can get it done? But the sacraments of the church is baptism and the Lord's Supper. And, and he says, remember these things. And he tells them here, you've got a problem because there's not much love in your love feast. You're not really acting like you're supposed to. In fact, these false teachers are come in and, and they're messing your whole thing up and you're letting them. So we have to be careful about that. When we come together, make sure that the purpose is what it should be. And then he says, don't forget about the second coming of Jesus. And this is what I began thinking about. If there, there are those, as I said in my first message, that are saying that Jesus wasn't really God. Or some would say maybe he became God because he lived a perfect life. But if Jesus is not divine and he's not God, then he's not coming back. He's not, he's not changing time. But my Bible says that one day Gabriel will put one foot on the land and one on the sea and will blow his trumpet and say that time will be no more. Jesus will split the sky as it rolls back. And he will come again. And that's what he says here. Even Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Only seven generations after Adam, he's already prophesying there'll be a day when God will come and judge all those who are sinners. God will come and, and we're going to stand before him. The Apostle Paul says, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Do you want to stand before the judgment? We're all going to have to, but i got good news. Just like here on earth, you can go before the judge, and if you've got a good lawyer, you can get off. And I've got a good lawyer. Jesus is our advocate. Amen. When we stand before the judgment of God, we have a lawyer who is Jesus, who's going to say, Father, yes, all the things were done that the devil says that they did, but I have wiped them all clean in heaven. And they are mine. And they are forgiven. And we're going to go to heaven because of what he did. Because we have a lawyer who will stand before God for us. When he returns again, it is our blessed hope for a Christian. When I wasn't a Christian, it was my most terrifying moment ever. The fact that one day time will stop. One day I'll stand before God. One day I'll give an account for all the bad things I've done. That was my fear. But when we know Jesus, it becomes our blessed hope. The thing that we're looking forward to, our, our greatest hope in the world is that he's coming back and he's going to make everything right. The Son of Man is going to come in his glory of his heavenly Father with his angels. And he will repay every man according to his deeds. He said he's coming back. And the resurrection is going to happen. It says in verse 15 there, he's coming back to judge everyone. If he's going to judge everyone, what about the ones who've already died? Everyone we means those who are dead and those who are alive. As we see in the picture here from Revelation, the word that God's going to call them forth from the sea, from the land, from everywhere. And we're all going to stand before him. Daniel, back in Daniel's day, before the New Testament, before Jesus came, Daniel said, multitudes who sleep in the dust, their bodies, he means, will awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt and shame. Which one will you be in? You want to rise. Your body's coming up, but which group are you going to be in? He says there will be a final accountability. Once we're judged, as we, we've seen here, that God's going to separate us all. And it's not on how good you've been, it's what have you done with Jesus. God gave us one way out, one option, that provides eternal life, and that's his son Jesus. You can't pay $30 billion and get into heaven. You can't do enough good stuff. It only says, do I really believe in that Jesus died for me on a cross, that all of my sins can be forgiven if I put my trust in him completely. And he will change me to be different. But the final accountability just isn't believed anymore. The false teaching is everybody goes to heaven.
every time I go to a funeral, it doesn't matter if the person says they're religious or not, they always say they're in a better place. <laughs> says who? We, we, we like to think that, and you know, it's like an all dogs go to heaven. You know, we, we want to believe that everybody goes, but that's not what the Bible says. In fact, there's teachers who have went off the rails. Carlton Pearson, a former mega pastor of Pentecostal Church, now says that everybody goes to heaven. Rob Bell was at Morris Hill Bible Church, and he said, um, I've come to believe that there's no longer any hell. Everybody goes to heaven. And he had to leave the church. For it's a point that a man wants to die, but after that, the judgment. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So each one of us may receive due, due for the things we've done in the body, whether good or bad. But cowards, unbelievers, corrupt, murderers, immoral, and those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers and liars, their fate is a fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is a second death. But you were made for eternity. He tells them there in verse 7, if you think there's not a final accountability for your life, he says, look back at Sodom and Gomorrah. You think it's not going to happen? It already has. Here's an example. Here's what you can go and you can, you can see where God burnt these two cities and the, of the plain to the ground. He already did it to show us. He has a flood, which he destroyed the whole world with, with water. And you can find fossils everywhere to remind us that a worldwide flood happened because people rejected God so much there was only one righteous man, Noah. And God built an ark. And him and his family were spared. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus is now the only ark that's leaving this world and going to heaven. It's only in him. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other mediator between God and man except Jesus Christ. But if you don't believe he's divine, then he has no standing in heaven. Hallelujah, I'm glad I've got a lawyer that's going to stand with me with nail prints in his hand and his feet. And he's going to say, Father, I paid the price. I paid the price. This one can go in because he put his faith in what I did, not what he did. And we can know that. And we talked about it in Sunday school, the Christian assurance. We can be sure. There's many who say, well, you can't know if you will go to heaven. Are you going to heaven? I hope so. I think so. He said we can know. Romans 8, 16 says, His spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. I can't explain that. I can't make sense to you. It doesn't always feel like we are. But that moment when we are saved, there's something that happens. And it's different for each one of us that we know that God has forgiven us. And all along the path as we begin to walk with him, he'll continue to bear witness from time to time. We'll walk by faith and may not hear anything for a long time. And finally we say, God will bear witness again. And we'll feel the joy of heaven and know that all things are right between us and God. My grandfather was cranking an old car with the old crank. My uncle accidentally kicked it in gear. And the car took off and drug him and pinned him against the house, I think it was, until they could rescue him. And my grandfather said, as he lay there between life and death, he said, there was nothing between me and God. All was peace. I knew if I went to be with him, I was okay. You know, say your life flashes before your, before your eyes. Sometimes it does. But the question is, as it flashes, do you see the blood of Jesus? Because you put your faith in him. Have you trusted in him? As we come to the end of this service this morning, that's the question. Do, do we know him? 
You can't be good enough. You can't come to church enough. You can't, you can't sing enough songs. You can't pray enough. None of those things, as good as they are, will do it. It's only what he's already done. Jesus paid the price. Your sins are already paid for. The pardon has been written. The question is, will you take it? George Wilson, I think, killed someone back in the early 1900s in, in a robbery of a bank. And I can't remember what happened exactly, but the governor awarded him a pardon. But he wouldn't take it. And so he died an execution. The same with us. Jesus has already signed the pardon written in his hands. The pardon is yours. But if you don't take it, it won't do you any good. Let's all stand this morning. As we stand in the presence of God, if, if Jesus split the sky right now, and everybody who's ready would go to meet him, would you be in that group? Would you be left behind? Jesus wants to be your lawyer this morning. He's already paid the price. Will you let him? Just say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me. I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Just ask him right now if you don't know him. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you that you're our defender, that we won't stand before the Father by ourselves, but Jesus, our advocate, will be there with us. And the Father will remember the time when we bowed our knees and we said, come into my life. And he'll remember that we overcame, that we contended for the faith, and that we crossed the finish line. And you heard you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, may our hearts be believing the words you've spoken. And may we not quit until we finish. We want nothing more than to see your arms wide open and welcome us home. Father, may we walk this faith route and overcome everything Satan throws in our path to trip us up. That we may enter heaven's gates. In Jesus' name, and because of him alone, we are saved.